Observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. It will be worthy of a free, enlightened, and at no distant period, a great nation, to give mankind the magnanimous and too novel example of a people always guided by an exalted justice and benevolence. In his farewell address, President George Washington offered final advice to the nation that he had helped create. Washington warned the United States against maintaining a standing army, encouraged Americans to avoid all foreign alliances, and repeated his belief that the nation's survival and future greatness depended upon its virtue. Taking Washington's advice to heart, the United States attempted to follow a moral foreign policy based on neutrality and isolationism, avoiding foreign entanglements that might draw it into conflict. In the 50 years between the end of the Civil War and World War I, the United States' relationship with the rest of the world would undergo major changes as the nation completed its conquest of the West, created the world's most productive industrial economy, and acquired overseas possessions. Expanding out into the world raised many questions. Should the nation hold on to its traditional policy of isolation and keep the world at arm's length? Should it intervene in other nations' affairs to bring the benefits of democracy and the American way to nations in need? Or should it, like the great powers of Europe, acquire its own overseas empire and join the ranks of the great nations of the world? Today, we look back on the era of American expansion and ask many questions. What motivated the United States to expand its influence into the Caribbean and Pacific? How did the nation treat the people with whom it came into contact? The United States often brought its idealism to its foreign policy but good intentions were often bound by the prevailing beliefs about race and culture, and American actions and policies at times fell short of Washington's high ideals. Such was the case in the final conquest of the Native Americans as the young nation pushed westward. After the Union victory in the American Civil War, Settlers began to pour into the West, lured by offers of cheap and fertile land. There was only one problem. The interior of the continent belonged to large and powerful Indian nations. While white settlers poured onto the prairie, planting crops and grazing cattle and sheep, the American military sought to contain and subdue the Indian nations. Concerned that a war of extermination was immoral, President Grant, in the 1870s, introduced a peace policy, herding Indians onto reservations, where through education and missionary work, they might be indoctrinated into the white way of life. By the early 1880s, conditions on the Western reservations had become deplorable. As money meant for Indians was pocketed by corrupt administrators, people on the reservations died malnourished, homeless, and dispirited. The scandalous treatment of Native Americans was so bad that white reformers pushed through Congress their own solution to what had become known as the Indian problem. For American Indians, a law passed in 1887 would change their lives very dramatically. Congress passed a law that was called the Dawes Act, which tried to break up uh, tribal land and a lot of land individually to Indian families. People used to tell me, you look in one direction and as far as your eyes can see him. From there, as far as your eyes can see him. From there, as far as your eyes can see him. Any direction that used to be our land. Now we're, you know, subjected to parcels. And uh, this parcel is being checkerboarded, so we're isolated from one another. When land was allotted to people individually, rather than held collectively by a tribe, then it really was an attempt to undermine tribal identity. 
to get Indians to think individually as Americans, not as Arapaho or Cheyenne or Sioux. The subdivision of tribal lands under the Dawes Act left millions of surplus acres that were sold off to white settlers and investors. The money the government made from the land sales was supposed to finance Indian education. But what would be taught and who would teach it? Education should see the disintegration of the tribes and not their segregation. They should be educated not as Indians, but as Americans. Thomas Morgan, Indian Affairs Commissioner. But while they were going through that process, they were also detribalized. They were told that their values were not very good, that their way of life was no good, that they had to become Christians, that they had to become members of the white society. Only generations later would Americans rethink the morality of this final attempt to erase Indian cultural identity. The Plains Indians did not give up without one last effort at resistance. Out in the western mountains, the Paiute prophet Wavoka had a vision that dancing Indians would gain strength from their ancestors and set off natural disasters that would cleanse the west of the white intruders. The ghost dance movement spread across the west, alarming the American military. When groups of Lakotas fled their reservations in the winter of 1890, the U.S. 7th Cavalry tracked them down and on December 29, 1890, massacred 300 men, women, and children at a creek called Wounded Knee. Something else died there. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream, Black Elk. The massacre at Wounded Knee dealt a final death blow to the Plains Indians' way of life. 